So, if you don't keep up with Davy News, then you might not have noticed that I went on break. It's my first break from YouTube for four years, and Wizards of the Coast must have known that, because they decided to drop a new UA two weeks into it. So today, we're going to be going over the Dragonlance UA that definitely isn't a precursor to any multiverse-level expansion that might be in the pipe for a future release. This article brings us a new race in the Kender, a new subclass for the Sorcerer, and a really weird new concept surrounding backgrounds and feats, where you take a background that gives you a feat that unlocks other feats that can only be taken through roleplay. As always, keep in mind that the majority of this is just my opinion, and if you want to forget that the old Kender ever existed, then feel free to play your games however you want. And real quick, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my new patrons this month. Hexa Gone Wrong, Patrick Snipes, X Eat, Jeremy Thornbrug, Ash Y. Thank you all so much for pledging my Patreon. It is because of you that I am able to take my vacation days, but only when Wizards of the Coast doesn't have spontaneous major releases. But with that out of the way, Let's begin. So, first up is the new race, the Kender, a strange race of multiversal magpies who have been the bane of the halfling race since Dragonlance first thought them up. In the olden days, Kender were unquenchable little thieves who would go around stealing everything with no regard for personal property, and if you called them out on it, they'd give you their shit back just to turn around and steal it again. They were comic relief characters whose punchline just didn't land, and in the long long ago when 5e was first being invented, the Kender were going to be one of the sub-races for the halfling, but people hated their concept so much that they were removed before 5e ever went to print. According to this new article, they've been separated from their halfling conspirators, and their lore has been change so that they, as a race, are prone to finding and falling into multiversal portals, and multiversal portals spontaneously appear in their pockets to randomly give them shit as a way of keeping their magpie obsession without making an entire race objectively thieves. I personally think that, in a world of magic and miracles, this explanation is really stretching my suspension of disbelief, but I also didn't like the Kender before now, so my opinion of them as a gimmick is unchanged. As far as their mechanics go, Kender are small humanoids that move 30 feet and have advantage against fear because their self-preservation instinct is not very strong. They also possess the ability to instinctively hone in on the things that bother a person and weaponize those feelings to give a target disadvantage on all their attack rolls. Finally, once they hit third level, Kender can pull items out of extra-dimensional spaces by reaching into any type of container, and an item will be pulled out to be randomly determined by this list. Ultimately, I get that they wanted to move away from making any race uniformly interested in stealing everything from you, but they seem to have replaced it with making the race uniformly annoying to the point of combat effectiveness. They added the descriptor that this talent is supernatural, as if it's not a trait inherent to them, but let me tell you, after playing with enough people who seem to possess the same talent, it has always been supernatural. Moving on to the subclass, sorcerers can rejoice as standing outside to scream at the moon has finally yielded results, and you can now prove to your parents that being a moon child wasn't a phase. First things first, you can bring down moonbeams in the form of the sacred flame spell, and this version is ovular enough to hit two people if they're standing right next to each other. You also get a bunch of new spells, which I normally wouldn't give much thought to, but in this case, you get three separate lists of first to fifth level spells that you can swap between on a long rest, and you can cast each spell on the list you chose once per long rest, which should go a long way in helping sorcerers with their very modest spell slots. Further into the subclass, your phase of the moon will let you reduce meta magic cost by one sorcery point whenever you cast a spell from the list, or from a school of magic tied to your phase, meaning if you pick your phase right, you can use one point meta magics as often as you want. Which gets even stronger with the next feature that lets you spend a sorcery point to shift your phase of the moon immediately, making you a weird kind of stance dancer that changes their ability on the fly to best suit the situation. The last two features give you miscellaneous abilities, the first one tying itself to your moon phase and giving you either a shining light that provides advantage on saving throws to your friends, advantage on stealth plus disadvantage to enemies that try to hit you in dim light and darkness, or a straight up resistance to necrotic and radiant damage, and the last one is a catch all that shines bright as a bonus action to blind enemies and heal allies. This is a pretty solid sorcerer choice. It addresses the main issues that people have with the sorcerers, being the lack of spell slots and the over-reliance on the small sorcery resource, and I'd say that it's definitely better than what the sorcerer had going for it beforehand, but not to the extent that I'd ban it from my table just out of principle. If more subclasses tried to find ways to give players back their resources, then the monk wouldn't look as bad as it does either. I feel a little weird about making some of the meta magic cost nothing at all, but I'd have to play with the lunatic before I make a judgment call on whether it makes the sorcerer OP or just fun to play. In any case, those are the two new race slash class options, but it looks like wizards is trying hard to get people to care about backgrounds again, because this UA has two of them, the Knight of Salamnia and the Mage of High Sorcery, both of which give a feat just like the Strixhaven backgrounds. And more interestingly, both of those feats then open up to three other feats that can only be taken if you've gotten the first one. For instance, the first background is the Knight of Salamnia, which means that you've sworn yourself to the main good guy country, and now other knights are your bros. Pretty typical stuff, and you get the same principle from the normal knight background, but the Salamnian Knight also gives you the Squire of Salamnia feat, which gives you proficiency in medium armor and martial weapons if you don't already have them, advantage against being knocked off your horse, and once per long rest, you can use your reaction to encourage somebody to not fuck up their saving throws. Much like with Strixhaven, this is a huge advantage compared to the other backgrounds, and if you don't use the common free feat at level 1 rule, I'd recommend removing the feat part of this background entirely. But if you do get this feat, then it opens up the option to choose three other feats called the Knight of the Crown, Sword, and Rose, all of which do different things and act as a mechanical bolster to your roleplaying as your character swears themselves to one of the three tenets of Salamnia. You can take as many of these feats as you'd like, but your character can only be sworn to one group at a time, and if you don't want the background in the first place, 
choice, but you still want those feats, the initial Squire of Salamnia does come with a prerequisite, but that prereq is not a mechanic. It's the role-playing prereq of having squireship in the Knights of Salamnia. Basically, if you don't take the background, the only way to get the first feat in the tree is to be rewarded for your role-playing efforts, which I think is the coolest thing ever. I still think that if they're going to go down this path of adding backgrounds that grant you a specific feat, they should officialize the common homebrew of giving a free feat to players who didn't get one with their background. I do that already, it helps players flesh out their archetypical gimmicks, and in a system that has distinctly less player options than other games, giving them one more option is a breath of fresh air. The same thing is true for the Mage of High Sorcery. That one gives you the feat Initiate of High Sorcery, and then it breaks it up into the Adept of the White, Red, or Black Robes, all of which can only be taken if you apprentice yourself within the Mages of High Sorcery, or whatever crazy matter group you homebrew into your own games. Then the last two feats, Divinely Favored and its next step, Divine Communications, don't have a background attached to them, but you still need to take Favored before you can take Communications, showing a progression of strength and feats that we haven't seen since pre-5e days, and if you really squint, the Armor Proficiency feats. I don't want this video to be too long, so I'm not going to go into detail about each individual feat. You can read the article for a salty surprise, but at least to my cursory glance, none of them look game-breaking. Maybe Magical Balance is giving me some nervous ticks, but everything else just looks neat. Overall, this is a fun UA that tried a lot of different things, and even if I don't like some of them, I'm always going to appreciate the effort more than with a safe, subclass-centric UA, and I hope to see more weird gimmicks getting the spaghetti method in the future. But that'll about do it! I hope you enjoyed this video, be sure to do all the things that I know you do, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can stay financially stable while I return to the vacation void and slumber for several aeons. But yeah, Davy out.